The Kraft Foods Company presents Willard Waterman as the Great Gildersleeve. The Great Gildersleeve is brought to you partially transcribed by the Kraft Foods Company. Well, this is the week most of the kiddies start back to school. This always creates a great deal of consternation and preparation throughout the nation. And in the city of Summerfield, there's one home contributing more than its share to the confusion. Yeah, it's the home of the great Gildersleeve. Come on, Leroy. Okay. Here's your lunchbox, Leroy. Okay, Bertie. Leroy, the judge is waiting to take us. Shake a leg. Uh, Leroy, let me look at that shirt. Oh, my goodness. Gosh, Marge, I gotta go. I thought I saw a spot on your clean shirt. You spilled prune juice. You'll have to change. Oh, for corn's sake. No. Marge, it isn't bad. It just looks like a dark button. What about them ears, Leroy? What about them? Bertie, I renovated his ears personally. Let's get going, Leroy. You'll be late for school. I was ready 15 minutes ago. Then Marge and Bertie started picking on me. Women. I just want you to look nice, Leroy. You want to make a good impression on your teacher the first day. What's the difference if I'm going to disappoint her the rest of the year? <laughs> The judge is impatient. Honky, you would have to put our car in the shop this week. You now it's all my fault. Here, Leroy, put on this tie. Tie? Marjorie, the boy doesn't need a tie. Heck no, ties choke me. It's stuffy enough in a schoolroom anyway. Leroy, lift your chin. I won't wear it. Yes, you will. Now that you're older, you should wear one every day. Who ever heard of a tie and blue jeans? <laughs> Let's get going. I have a meeting with the mayor. You're all right, Judge. Mort, if you're going to meet the mayor, you should have a handkerchief in your breast pocket. Yeah, I have one in my hip pocket. <laughs> I just ironed your best one, Mr. Gillsleeve. Now you just run upstairs and get it. I'm going to run right out the door. Come on, Leroy. I'm way ahead of you. Goodbye, Mars. Bye, Bertie. Goodbye. Leroy, did you polish your shoes? Shoes, schmooze. Mr. Gillsleeve, don't you want that handkerchief? No. Start the car, Judge. <laughs> Judge, you're not very talkative this morning. Gildy, I'm happy to show for you and Leroy, but I'm not in the habit of being kept waiting. It was the women, Judge. They wouldn't let us go. Change your shirt, wash your ears, or your shoes shine. Yeah. And don't forget your breast pocket handkerchief. Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose your tiredness is understandable. Of course, I have no such problems to contend with around my house. I get up in the morning, have my rye crisp and a beaker of Kalak water, and I'm off to the bench. <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are, Judge. No women. Well, they certainly made us late this morning. The mayor's going to be seething. Darn old women. Well, I'm afraid I'm late also. Blame it on the women. I'm telling you, Judge, they run the world. <laughs> Quite true, Leroy. Leroy, where'd you hear that? I heard you say it once. <laughs> Bill. You know what we ought to do, Unc? You what, Leroy? We ought to boycott him. Boycott him? Sure. Let's us three bachelors make a deal. Never have anything to do with him. You know, that's hard to do, my boy. <laughs> we'll let him cook our food and mend our clothes and keep house, but we won't have anything to do with him. <laughs> now, Leroy, someday when you're a little older, the right girl will come along and you'll change your mind in the twinkling of an eye. True, isn't it, Gilday? You Well, you'll recognize the magic moment. A chance meeting, perhaps. A drop glove. A lady in distress. Or an exchange of glances. You judge, here's the school. And the spark is ignited as the world stands still. And somewhere, bells begin to ring. I know. What's this, Judge? Gilday, you know what I mean. You well, I've never heard the bells ring, but I could be a little deaf. <laughs> No, Unc's never been down for the count. He hardly looks at women anymore, do you, Unc? You watch it, Judge. The lady's pulling out from the curb. What? Be careful. She's going to pull right... Oh, oh Judge. Now you've done it. You banged right into her bump. It wasn't the judge's fault. Why didn't she watch where she was going? Women. Well, 
It appears the lady and I have locked bumpers. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's all right. It was our fault. It was not. Leroy. We'll fix it. Gildy, get out and fix it. Yes, yes. <coughs> Why don't you get out? Well, I'm driving. That's obvious, Judge. Uh, you stand on one side of the bumper and... And I'll stand on the other and we'll bounce the car. Leroy, the bell will be ringing any minute. I can get to my seat before the bell stops ringing. Yeah, all right. <laughs> well, let's hurry. You can only take a moment, madam. Bounce, Leroy. <laughs> Big car. <laughs> Doesn't bounce easily. That did it, huh? She's clear, Gilda. Yeah, I know it, Judge. You're all right now, madam. No damage done. Hope you weren't shaken up. No, not at all. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's all right. I have to be running along now, so... 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 <laughs> She's pretty. Well, thanks again. Uh, wait a minute. Please. Yes? Uh, madam, you miss... Mrs.? Ah! Yeah, this car you're driving... Doesn't it belong to Mr. Bullard? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, I thought so. He's a neighbor of mine, you know. Really? Ah, oh, remember the deal! You now then... I'm sorry, but I must be going. But, but I... I wonder who she is. Ah, oh, get out of the middle of the street! <laughs> what a beautiful woman. Gildy, the bells are ringing. <laughs> that was a strange thing that happened to me this morning. I haven't been able to get her out of my mind all day. Okay. Yeah. Right. You. What is it, Marjorie? Yeah, I'm coming home. Why? Well, you walked right past our house. You? <laughs> yeah, I did, didn't I? An exchange of glasses, and the bells began to ring. There's something on your mind, Uncle Mort? Is something on my mind? You don't know. Nothing but my hat. You're not wearing a hat. <laughs> yeah, I must have left it at the office. <laughs> By the way, Marjorie, do you have any idea who was driving Mr. Bullard's car this morning? What's this? Does he have a girlfriend we don't know about? Oh, <laughs> Unky, that's Mr. Bullard's sister. His sister? Well, great. <laughs> she has a daughter about Leroy's age. She, she has a daughter? Uh-huh. She and Leroy walked home from school together. Married. Huh? Well, she was. About three years ago, her husband left her at Big Ranch in Arizona. Oh. Isn't she attractive, Unky? Well, you we just exchanged glances. Yeah, that is all I had was a passing glance at her this morning. <laughs> you know her name, Marjorie? Well, the little girl's name is Babs. I don't know what their last name is. Yeah, it isn't important. It means nothing to me. I mean, that is... Say, there's Mr. Bullard in the yard inspecting his chrysanthemums. I think I'll run over and pass the time of day. Let me know what her name is, Auntie. No, Marjorie. As long as I'm going over, I might find out what her name is. Show a neighborly interest. Well, hello, Mr. Bullard. Good afternoon, Gildersleeve. Yeah, I see you're in your chrysanthemum bed. Obviously. <laughs> Gathering a bouquet for the table tonight? Yeah, I see you have company. Oh, you do? Yeah, I saw her in your car at school today. Well, bully for you. <laughs> well, I guess your sister, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Gildersleeve, if you came over here to get my sister's vital statistics, suffice it to say she was born in 1916, she's five feet five and three quarter inches tall, and she weighs 118 pounds. Yeah. You well. And at present, she is very happy. You well, good, good day. Well, wait a minute. Gildersleeve, take this chrysanthemum. Me? Why? I don't want your trip over here to be a total loss. <laughs> <laughs> He's a hard man to like.
Yeah, that stuffy Bullard. Practically forbidding me to meet his sister. It isn't as though I were a don't. I'm the water commissioner. You know, I'm a taxpayer. I own my own home. I have a right to know who my neighbors are. Hey, you, Leroy. Hey, what's the matter? Look at my bike wheel. That's a bike wheel? <laughs> what happened to the spokes? Babs knocked them out. Babs? Yeah, Mrs. Winthrop's brat over at Bullard's. Mrs. Winthrop. <laughs> so that's her name. What do you care what her name is? Look at my bike wheel. No, Leroy, let's not get upset. How did it happen? I was riding down the sidewalk, no hands, and she stuck a broom handle through the spoke. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Isn't that a dirty trick? What are you going to do about it? No, Leroy, I can't imagine Mrs. Winthrop's daughter doing a thing like that. Oh, she did. What are you going to do about it? Well, I think I should take you across the street so you can apologize. Apologize? Me? Come along, my boy. Why should I apologize? I wasn't doing anything. Well, Leroy... Oh, get it. She sticks a blue handle through my spoke, so I have to apologize. I don't get it. Leroy, not so loud. I don't get it. Give me one good reason why I should apologize. Well, for one thing, there's a woman involved. And the man always apologizes to the woman. That's the chivalrous thing to do. But, uh... Yep, on the porch, Leroy, like a little man. This is silly. Leroy. I don't get it. Shh. Yes? Uh, pardon me, Mrs. Winthrop. I'm Trockmorton P. Gildersleeve. We talked briefly this morning. At school, lock bumpers, remember? Oh, yes. Uh, this is my nephew, Leroy. How do you do, Leroy? Hi. We live across the street. <laughs> I'm the city water commissioner. Yes, my brother Rumson's been telling me about you. You well, don't believe everything he says. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, that is, we came over to apologize. Apologize? It seems your little daughter stuck a broom handle through Leroy's bicycle wheel, and he feels pretty bad about it. Don't you, Leroy? If you say so, Unc. <laughs> That's the boy. Now, apologize. I, I'm afraid I don't understand. Leroy, you say Babs deliberately put a broom handle through your bicycle wheel? Yeah, and I wasn't doing anything. Well, then why should you apologize? Ask Unc! <laughs> well... Well, as a matter of fact, Babs should apologize. You no, know, no, the apologies are all ours. Well, why? You Well, Mrs. Winthrop... Unc says there's a woman involved. Oh. Yeah, well, what I mean was, uh, the man always apologizes to the woman. That's a chivalrous thing to do. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, aren't you being a little mid-Victorian? Mid-Vic who? <laughs> oh. Well, this all seems so silly. Yes, well, I just thought we'd come over and, and apologize. Well, what for? What's the reason? Well, I thought I had a reason when I came over. <laughs> Maybe that was your reason, Unc. You just wanted to come over. Me, right. <laughs> Is the apology finished? Yeah, and so am I. <laughs> Come on, Leroy, let's go home. Seeing Mr. Bullard's beautiful sister was the most electrifying experience that Greg Gildersleeve ever had. But so far, he's been thwarted in his attempts to be neighborly. Mm. Yeah. She's so lovely. And I shouldn't have gone over there. She made me feel like a tongue-tied adolescent. Water Commissioner, you missed the boat. While the water commissioner flounders, let's look in on the Bullard Fortress and see how they're reacting to his latest sally. Rumson? In the solarium, Paula. Oh, there you are. I just had a little chat with you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> he came over to apologize. For living? <laughs> no, but it was a strange apology. Leroy was riding his bicycle and Bab stuck a broom handle through his wheel. It was a terrible thing for her to do. So, what happened? Mr. Gildersleeve came over to apologize to me. Oh, did he? Paula, I can read Gildersleeve like a book. A big, thick, very dull book. 
The only reason he came over here was to try to meet you. Oh, it was quite obvious. I suppose I should consider it flattering. Paula, how could you? Well, not every man would go to such lengths to meet a woman. And I gave him such a bad time. You did? Paula, I'm proud of you. <laughs> You're a true bullet. Rumson, I think I should go over and speak to Mr. Gildersleeve. Go over there? Are you out of your mind? Well, it's the least I can do after what Babs did to Leroy. All right. All right. Go ahead. Waste your time with the water commissioner. After all, you're 36. 35. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Anyway, you're old enough to know what you're doing. Thank you. But you don't know what you're doing to your brother. Are you really going? Yes. After dinner. The heat has affected her mind. <laughs> Gildersleeve, this isn't like you, letting a woman ruin your dinner. I couldn't eat a bite. It isn't that I'm thinking about her. I'm just thinking what a fool she made of me. Arthur Morris. Yes, Marjorie. Mr. Peavy's here. He is? Uh -huh, he wants to drive you to the Jolly Boys meeting tonight. Well, I don't think I'll go, but... Come in, Peavy. Yeah, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> you ready for your meeting? Well, I'm not going tonight. Thanks, Peavy. Hmm. Have a date, do you? Peavy, I'll never have another date. Okay. Unky's <laughs> disappointed in women, Mr. Peavy. You don't say. Uh-huh. <laughs> you met Mr. Bullard's sister today. Well, I met her too, but I didn't notice anything that would disappoint a fella. <laughs> don't you let her fool you, Peavy. She's just another Rumson Bullard. <laughs> well, she's prettier. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you two alone. Cheer him up, Mr. Peavy. I'll try it. You uh, care for a wintergreen, Mr. Gildersleeve? No, thanks, Petey. Let's see if I can remember any amusing stories told around the fountain today. You never mind. I take it you wish you had a date. Petey, the lady just assumed I came over to ask for a date. Actually, I only went to apologize. Well, what did you do to apologize for? Yeah, let's not go into that. <laughs> yeah. She tried to embarrass me in front of Leroy. Just because she's a woman, she toyed with me, like a cat toys with a mouse. Well, women can do that on occasion. I know I'm a little mousy sometimes around Mrs. Peavy. Well, I'm no mouse. I can play rough, too. I'm going to rear up in my hind legs and have nothing to do with it. My, my. You know, I mean it, Peavy. From now on, Mrs. Winthrop can go her way and I'll go mine. In fact, I'm not even going to speak to her. Hey, Uncle! Uh, what is it, Leroy? That Mrs. Winthrop's coming across the street. She is? Yeah, I mean, she is. What do you suppose she wants? Maybe she wants to play cat and mouse. <laughs> yeah, all right, Pete. Here she is, Unc. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'll skip out the back door so you two can be alone. Your Peavy, no. stand to your ground. I'm going to. Yeah. Leroy? Yeah? Answer the door and tell Mrs. Winthrop I'm not at home. Oh, boy, will I? Why did she have to come over here anyway? Hi, Mrs. Winthrop. Hello, Leroy. I'd like to speak to Mr. Gildersleeve. Unc says he isn't home. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Is there any message? No. And you needn't bother to tell him I called. Okay. Leroy. I sure fixed that, huh, Unc? <laughs> well, you fixed it all right. Now I'll have to go over and explain. Why did you tell her I wasn't home? You said to tell her you weren't home. <laughs> you didn't have to be rude. I didn't say to tell her. I said to tell her I wasn't home. Yes, you did. You said, tell her I'm not at home. Yes, but... Didn't you, Mr. Peavy? Yes, you did. <laughs> Peavy, you keep out of this. I know what I'm doing. No, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> That Leroy. What a terrible thing to say to a lady. Well, she'll understand it was simply a boyish prank. Sure. Hmm? Here she comes. I can hear her little feet on the hall carpet. What is it, Gildersleeve? Oop, bullet. <laughs> uh, nice evening. It was. 
<laughs> yes, well, the reason I came over, Mr. Bullard, I'd like to speak to your sister, Mrs. Winter. Oh, uh, well, I have a message for you, Gildersleeve. Really? Yes. She says she isn't home. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I know that. She did. <laughs> no, this whole thing is a mistake. You are so right. Good night, Gildersleeve. But, Bullard. Good night, Gildersleeve. In just a minute. Gildersleeve, you rainbarrel Romeo. Get off my porch! <laughs> rainbarrel. That does it. Bullard, I'll never speak to you or any member of your family again as long as I live. Gildersleeve, I have only one thing to say. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Well, ha to you, too. <laughs> us up in your car, Judge. We get ours tomorrow, don't we, Uncle? Yeah, tomorrow. It's been no trouble at all, Gilder. By the way, I understand the lady who captured your fancy yesterday morning was Mr. Bullard's sister. Judge, she didn't capture my fancy. Hello, boy, Uncle. Tell him. Now, now on, I'm having absolutely nothing to do with Bullard or his sister either. Women do nothing but complicate a man's life. You said it. Gilder, that's not the way you felt after you talked to her yesterday morning. As I recall, you were seeing stars and hearing bells. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous, Judge. I did nothing of the kind. I realized right then that Paula Winthrop was just like Bullard. I saw right through her attempts to be friendly with me. She didn't pull the wool over my eyes for a second. What's this? Now, get out there. You know, don't you try to defend her, Judge. She's just like all women. You know, all Bullards. You can't trust them. Next time I meet her on the street, I'll cross over to the other side. Now you're talking, Unc. Well, here you are, Leroy. Almost time for school. You better run in, my boy, before the bell rings. Okay. Oops. Who did that? Somebody smacked us. If they scratch my back bumper... You dim-witted drivers. Well, yeah. Mr. Bullard's car. Bullard! Yeah, this is what I've been waiting for. Let me handle it, Judge. Punch him in the nose, huh? Now, Gilder. Stand back, Judge. What's the matter with you, Bullard? Can't you see where you're going? You, you, you. It's you. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve. You, Paula. Yeah, I mean, Mrs. Winthrop. I didn't know it was you. Mr. Gildersleeve, wasn't that rather stupid of you, stopping right in front of me? Stupid? No, wait. All you had to do was look back and you could have seen I was going to park here. Yes, but she looks so sweet. But she sounds just like Bullard. What you doing, huh? Hurry up, Gilda. Yeah, all right, Mrs. Winthrop. I'm very sorry we happen to be on this street. And I'm very sorry we happen to be stopped right where you were driving. Yeah, I'm very sorry for living. Are you really? Yes. Why don't you come over this evening and apologize? Rumson won't be home, but I will. Yeah, I'm sure I'd be home. Hey, the bell's ringing! He knows it, Leroy. The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a minute. Let's see. Monday. Hi there, Bertie. What's cooking? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to figure out, Mr. Houston. Just what Bertie's going to be cooking. I'm planning next week's meals. Oh, what's this you have down here for lunch, Bertie? Or, or here, where you have Velveeta apple sandwiches with bacon. Oh, that's one of Mr. Gilsley's favorites, Mr. Heaston. Mmm, are they easy to make, Bertie? Yes, sir. You just spread slices of toast with Kraft mayonnaise and put a slice of good golden Velveeta on each one. Then just put a thick broiled apple ring on the Velveeta and top each sandwich off with two slices of bacon you partly broiled. Then Bertie slides those sandwiches into a medium oven till the bacon is crisp and the Velveeta's melted. 
It never takes long because they'll beat them now so easy. <laughs> and do they come out good? Well, I'll bet, Bertie. After all, Kraft's pasteurized processed cheese food is delicious with its rich yet mild cheddar flavor. And those Velveeta sandwiches stick to your ribs, too, Mr. Houston. Right you are, Bertie. Velveeta is rich in important food values from milk, so it's good for every member of the family. You know, even tiny tots can enjoy it because Velveeta is digestible as milk itself. That's why Bertie cooks with Velveeta so much, Mr. Heaston. <laughs> Velveeta is wholesome good. You're right, Bertie. That's it. Bertie cooks with Velveeta because it's wholesome good. I know, Bertie. Mr. Heaston, you know why Bertie cooks with Velveeta so much? Yes, Bertie. That's right, because Velveeta is wholesome good. <laughs> What a night, Paula. The full moon, the hammock. Lovely, isn't it? You know, I misjudged you. I thought you were pretty hard to get along with. Now I know that isn't true. You're gentle and sweet. Thank you, Pop Morton. I really like you very much. You do? <laughs> Paula. I hear bells again. Mm. That's my brother, Wilson, at the front door. Whoop, bullet. I'll sneak out through the hedge. Good night, Paula. Good night, folks. <laughs> Gilda's Sleeve is played by Willard Waterman. The show is written by John Elliott and Andy White. It is partially transcribed. Included in the cast are Walter Tetley, Mary Lee Robb, Lillian Randolph, Gail Gordon, Gene Bates, Earl Ross, and Dick Legrand. Musical compositions by Jack Meekin. This is John Heaston saying good night for the Kraft Foods Company, makers of those famous Kraft quality foods. Be sure to listen in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for the further adventures of The Great Gilda's Sleeve. Thank you.